when I was in Nepal, I went to the UNHCR to talk about the research I had done on the IDP camps or refugee camps. And I step into the room and a British friend I made at the NGO where I was based, she wanted to tag along for the day. She's white. When I walk into the room and I'm ready to sit down and show my research, all their eyes are directed at her. They keep asking her the questions. I keep answering the questions. And it's like, when are these people going to realize that I'm Annabelle and I'm the one doing the research? Because Asia, as much as like, there's no history of enslavement of Africans in Asia under Europeans, but somehow this thing has penetrated every corner of the world. Somehow, Deep in the Himalayas, when I walk into a room in the UNHCR, when people see me walk in to explain my research, they automatically think it could never be me who is conducting this research. Hey everyone, welcome to Flourish in the Foreign a podcast that elevates and affirms the voices and stories of Black women living and thriving abroad. This podcast explores living abroad as a pathway to wellness for Black women and wellness in all aspects, professional, financial, spiritual, emotional, mental, and physical. Welcome back to the show. And if you're new, hello, I'm Christine. I'm a Black American woman and business strategist thriving here in Barcelona, Spain, and I am the host, creator, producer, social media manager, and everythinger of this here podcast. This podcast is a labor of love, but labor nonetheless, and that's why I'm asking you to please support this podcast. There are several ways for you to support Flourish in the Foreign. One, become a Patreon supporter of this podcast. You can do so by going to www.patreon.com slash flourish foreign. Thank you to all of my Patreon supporters. I truly appreciate all of your support. We currently have eight Patreon supporters right now. And once we get to 10, I will be dropping a second episode of this podcast that week. Two episodes in the same week. So if you've been on the fence and you're thinking about becoming a Patreon supporter, definitely do so. Some of the benefits of being a Patreon supporter include bonus episodes and replays of the live Q&A sessions that I am hosting. I have hosted two so far, one with Adelia, which was amazing, and that is already up and available for the Patreon supporters. And the most recent one with Jackie of The Jackie O Life. We really, really had a great conversation. And shout out to everyone that joined us for that conversation. The replay, as I said before, is available to our third tier Patreon supporters. This coming Sunday, there is another live Q&A session, this time with Carla of Rose Apple Global, talking all about how to be a career professional abroad, how to take your career abroad. Some of you may remember Carla, who has lived in five different countries, including Bangladesh, Afghanistan, the UAE, Singapore, and Dominica. She is definitely an expert out here in these expat streets. So if you're interested in joining these lives, make sure that you are a part of the Flourish in the Foreign community. Just sign up via the links on the website or in the bios across social media. That's where I'm going to be sending out event details. You don't want to miss out. Definitely join us as we have these live Q&A sessions with our podcast guests. The second way you can support Flourish in the Foreign is by Cash App. You can Cash App this podcast at dollar sign Flourish Foreign. And Cash App is basically a tip jar. If you listen to an episode that just really moves you, resonates, is exactly what you're looking for, or just surprisingly amazing, 
you can go ahead and slip the podcast a couple of bucks just like that. And shout out to Kennedy and Ivy that cash out to the podcast this week. Thank you guys so much for enjoying the podcast, listening, and of course, supporting the podcast. And please know that any amount of support is always deeply, deeply appreciated. The third way you can support the podcast is by placing an ad within the podcast or supporting an entire episode of this podcast. If you have a business or service or perhaps an organization that is in alignment with this podcast and you want to get in front of this audience of just amazingly ambitious, educated, internationally minded black women, go ahead to the Flourish in the Foreign website, www.flourishintheforeign.com slash contact and drop me a line and I will let you know how we can collaborate. The fourth way you can support this podcast is by sharing this podcast. It is super important. By sharing this podcast across your own social media, your Insta stories, your grid, your Twitter, your Facebook, all these things, people know that you are giving your seal of approval. That's what it does. It is way better marketing than I could ever do because your network trusts you. So if you really dig this podcast and you enjoy it, please, please consider sharing this podcast with all of your friends via your social media because your recommendation is way more valuable than me saying, y'all should listen to my podcast. So please, please do that. And also be sure to tag the podcast at Flourish Foreign across all social media. That's Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And also follow the podcast across social media. Again, at Flourish Foreign. The fifth way you can support Flourish in the Foreign is by subscribing to the podcast, giving the podcast five stars, and leaving a review. I truly enjoy reading the reviews. They are so wonderful. They make my heart so full. If you are enjoying the podcast, be sure to rate the podcast five stars, leave a review, and make sure you are subscribed. Okay, I just gave you five different ways to support this podcast, and I hope you at least chose one way to support this podcast today. All right, that is it for the support portion of this show. Now, on to the next story. Today's story features Annabelle, and I have to say, I was so excited to sit down and record with her. I actually saw her being interviewed on YouTube, and when I saw her interview, I just knew I had to have her on the show. She is so introspective and so smart, and I think that the insights that she shares are really interesting and really helpful. But I'm going to let her tell you all about it. My name is Annabelle. I'm 29 and I live in Tokyo, Japan. I first went abroad when I was 19 or 20 and I went to St. Kitts, an island in the Caribbean near to Jamaica. My hometown is Kingston St. Andrew in Jamaica. I think my parents always talked about their travels. It was always just this kind of idea that traveling is something people do. It didn't seem like a foreign concept to me. My parents always talked about their travels. And all of my older siblings lived in New York at the time. When I was little, my parents would have been taking me to see my older siblings, though I don't remember it. And my father is an avid reader and he always was very strict with my sister and I about reading a lot. And then you just kind of get a broader worldview from a very young age with a father like that, I guess. I never really saw myself as a a Jamaican first. I just kind of saw myself as a human in the world. And I suppose that's what would have planted a seed for me. I studied architecture in Jamaica for my undergraduate degree. There was a St. Kitts trip in my third year. It's a part of the architecture degree in Jamaica that we have to study other Caribbean islands and study their urban environment. We did a, we call it study tour, and it's a study of the capital city of whatever country you go to. So in my third year, my class went to St. Kitts, and in my fourth year, we went to Barbados. And I I was really in love with Barbados. I kind of caught a bug of like just wanting to travel. Then we did our final 
design project. And then four years of school is over. And then I, I find this flyer for an urban planning and design summer school in Finland. It was all great because I, the transit would be through New York. I got to see my siblings and then I took the flight to Finland. Finland, it was really good to be in a class of students from all over the world. Some of them studied architecture like me. Some of them were all strictly urban planners. Some of them were geographers and sociologists. It was just really cool because architecture can be a very insular space sometimes where you only interact with other architects. It was really cool to like learn about other fields, but it was really weird and unfair to me how I just kind of showed up and was able to breeze through. But these students from Japan, China, Brazil, other European countries who don't speak English either, like and then the Finnish people themselves too. It was me and two American girls and probably a British guy who were the only native English speakers. And we were just breezing through. And then the rest of the people are studying this very difficult content in a language that's not their own. And I just felt it was so unfair. And it made me want to commit a part of my life from then on to learning other languages, reaching out to other people, not just kind of riding on this sort of like the rest of the world has to adjust to English kind of thing. It kind of felt like an extension of imperialism to me too. That's why it felt kind of icky. When I graduated, I was looking for jobs and I wasn't finding any right away. And there were friends in the undergraduate degree with me who they were working while they were in school. Like the cohort of us who were just coming out of high school into architecture school, at that age we would have been in our final year, 2021. 20, and then there were friends in the last world, early 30s, because they had to save in their 20s to come back and pay for architecture school. They had kind of warned me that sometimes when you fall into work, sure, you're in a firm and you're working but then the older you get, if you don't get certain accreditations and degrees and stuff, you never get higher pay. Eventually, you're just kind of leveled out. You're in the field that you love, but then your potential for growth is just kind of gone. I was very afraid of getting into a job after graduating the bachelor's degree and then just kind of getting stuck in it. And then the pay is just so bad generally for undergrad architectural designers. Your pay only starts to really kind of mean something once you've had a master's. I was very concerned about how low the pay was, how many years it would take me before I could even afford them. I was like, okay, I'm going to find a job, even if it's not in the field. I'm just going to suck it up for a bit, find a job that will pay me a lot more so I can save a lot faster. It won't take a whole decade or more before I can get a master's degree. Knowing that Annabelle was passionate about architecture and working at a firm in Jamaica, I was curious to know how she got to Japan. A friend of mine in undergrad, she had a sister who taught English in Japan. I didn't even tell her that I was thinking about it, or maybe I did mention it to her and I didn't remember, but when the applications had opened up, um, right when we were graduating, she sent me a picture of the ad in the newspaper and told me to look at it. I looked at it and I was like, okay, I mean, I was really passionate about architecture and like, I just didn't, didn't want to like, just do a job to make money. But it's like, for the, the long haul, it just made more sense. So I applied and then I got called for an interview. It's like, okay, this is serious. Okay. I really practiced. I was rehearsing for like probably two months before that interview. I had a whole book dedicated to just questions that they might ask and writing up my answers and stuff. And then the interview came and it went well. I already got the job in the firm. And then about five months into that job, I got accepted for the JET program, the Japanese English teaching program. It was like, I was really loving that job in that firm. But then this opportunity came and it's like, it was just a no-brainer. The pay, everything would have just made more sense to suck it up, teach English for a few years, save, get the master's done, right? So I did. I didn't even give a proper two weeks notice and I was just out of there. I was kind of reluctantly going to Japan, leaving a job in a field that I actually liked 
when I start, finally started to feel I was learning stuff about how to actually not just be in school, but work as an architect and everything. I asked Annabelle to tell me, when did she start learning Japanese and how was that process? Right. So when I applied for the JET program, I, of course, as reluctant as I was, I'm someone who likes to be prepared. I, I enrolled into classes. I was doing classes, maybe about eight months of Japanese classes. And when I got to Japan, I realized how different it is actually trying to speak versus what you learn in a book. But I had a really good teacher and um, she was brilliant. She lived most of her adult life in Jamaica. She was I mean, she was an honorary Jamaican. She was very much into the culture. She understood how to teach Jamaicans Japanese, how to translate certain things into social settings, which it's less generic than just trying to teach an English speaker. It was more tailored to who we were in the class. And I think that's, that's helped me ever since. I think like our Jamaican dialect patois, there are things that no matter how you try to stretch your brain, just do not translate well from Japanese to English but I can use Patois to help me understand it instead of English. Annabelle has decided to go to Japan to work so that she can save up money to go on and earn her master's. So I asked Annabelle, what was it like when she landed in Japan for the first time to live and work and hopefully save some money? It was about 18 Jamaicans that got accepted that year and were on the same flight together. And they were all so excited to be going, and I just could not care less. <laughs> like, their excitement was just almost bringing me down. Like, I'm like, oh my God, it, like, stop. When we finally landed, then I was kind of like, okay. We landed in Narita Airport in Chiba, Japan. It's north of Tokyo. And Chiba is very rural. It's just big open fields and stuff. Like, I kind of remember some of the people in my group some of the other Jamaicans being like, this is it. <laughs> it's just trees. She kind of had this expectation of what Japan might look or whatever. I thought that was kind of funny. And then we're starting to drive into the city. And I, I kind of remember trying to just really look for something that would make me feel like I'm in a different place. And just the difference, it just did not set in for a few months because it's sky above, same sun, same clouds. There's trees, there's roads, there's cars. We have tons of Japanese cars in Jamaica too, so the road didn't even look that different to me. <laughs> we got driven in a bus together to this area called Shinjuku, which is super central Tokyo. And then we got, you know, set up in our hotel, nice hotel. And then the next morning it was like, boom, 1,500 foreigners in this massive conference room getting our first day of training. And that was cool. It was cool seeing all these different nationalities of English speakers and hearing all these accents of English and then meeting all these kind of new people. And then it was only three days of orientation. And then we all got sent off to our respective prefectures. I got sent to a prefecture called Ishikawa, which is super rural. The day we took the flight, I was taken directly to my school to meet the school principal and the vice principal. And then the principal, she drove me around the town and tried to help me settle in. She took me to the supermarket, did my groceries. Um, my apartment already had furniture and stuff in it. I just needed to unpack. It was fun, but then getting overstimulated. And then finally, just like this quiet, once the door closed and my principal walks away and I'm just in this new apartment by myself. And it was kind of a feeling of happiness and relief to like get this quiet and then understand that like for the next year, at least this place would be mine. And I could always come and close the door and be quiet in that apartment. I asked Annabelle to tell me what her job entailed and how was her first year of living and working in Japan? It was a high school and my position was called assistant language teacher. But actual job in that specific high school was more like I planned the lessons and then the Japanese teachers just kind of translate for me. It was all like very chill, really chill. I spent most of my time at my desk studying Japanese more than anything else. And I'm really glad for that kind of hidden opportunity that that was to have all this time where I had to sit at this desk and I had to make this time mean something. 
it just was kind of natural to just study Japanese then. Because we were, that was a part of the contract. We were allowed to study Japanese. And in fact, we were encouraged to do so. And a condition of something they would ask in the JET interviews too. You had to be interested in Japan. You had to be interested in learning. You shouldn't just come there and do a job and get money and leave. Like they wanted you to be more invested in the culture or language or something. The job, it's like you do a job and you earn money. But I felt like I got a lot out of it. A lot more than just money out of it. Like gaining a language and just understanding human beings more because it's very funny how high school kids in a whole different country behave and the similarities and then then just like these wildly opposite things that they do you'd never see a jamaican kid doing i asked annabelle to tell me when and why she decided to apply for her master's program in japan Right. After the first year, I was not very savvy with money. In my mind, this job pays so well. I just need one year and then I'm going to save and then do a master's. And then after that first year came and then this thing called residence tax came around. Japanese residence tax is no joke. You get this massive bill for your residence tax and you're like, well, there goes all my hopes and dreams. You have to pay this residence tax. And then on top of that, you don't realize just how much they deduct. Like health insurance is mandatory in Japan. You cannot reside in Japan without health insurance. And any job you take, they will be deducting from your pay. After the first year, I did not save as much as I thought I would. I'm like, okay, I have to renew the contract for another year. And then the next year, being more aware now of the residence tax that would come at the end of the second year, most people on jet, they travel Asia and they really make the most of their time here. And I was just a hermit, which I enjoyed. It's fine. Riding my bike was free. I would ride my bike off into random places for the whole two years I was there. And that was enough for me. Luckily, I, I was able to discipline myself as tempting as it was to do other things like travel and whatever. At the end of two years, I had enough. And in the January of the second year, that's a year and a half into it now, I started applying to Japanese universities. Sometimes I, I have a thing about me where I don't realize how much stress I'm under or how much pressure I'm putting myself under until like after the fact. I didn't realize just how much of an impact settling in had on me, even though I thought I was fine the whole time. Just the idea of having to do that again in a new place, just the thought of it was nearly triggering for me. Like I cannot figure out another country right now. Even if it's English speaking, I can't, I can't figure out another place. I'm still figuring out Japan. But by that time as well, I had taken a language proficiency test and I did well. I'm like, okay, I can keep going and get the highest level of proficiency. I don't feel I'm done with the language. I don't feel I'm done with this place. I'm not ready to go to a new place. So that's why I started applying to Japanese universities. My best friend was studying in China and she had a Japanese professor and she set up a meeting um, for me with him. I left Ishikawa, went to Tokyo to meet this professor, and then he gave me really good advice. And then he introduced me to the professor at the university I'd end up at. It's called Keio University. It's a really prestigious, highly respected university in Japan. I applied. I did um, two rounds of entrance exams and interviews, and then I got into Keio. I was really curious to learn more about the experience of earning a master's in Japan. And so I asked Annabelle to describe each component of the master's program. The program was two years. The design studios that I took, one of them was led by a very famous architect. Anyone who does architecture will know his name. His name is Shigeru Ban. He was one of the reasons that Japan was on my radar too, because he's just a very innovative architect and I was able to study under him, which was wonderful. But he didn't play around. Like he was, he was serious. You had to work. Then there's the lab, which is like a job. And then there's a thesis, which is also a job. It's like working three full-time jobs. And then I was teaching English part-time, just make rent and buy a bit of groceries for the whole two years. I was a part of a project called the Vineyard House Project. And the Vineyard House Project in Japan, they call it veneer boards, but that's what we call plywood. It was a project about how to make structurally sound and earthquake resistant 
temporary buildings completely out of plywood. We were studying joinery and we did real tests, fireproofing tests, seeing that it would stand up to burn up to one hour without disintegrating or burn up to two hours without disintegrating. We did earthquake tests, putting it on a platform and like shaking it around to see like like if it could stand up to seven on the Richter scale or a lot of it, it was just real world and just so many real consequences and so much pressure. And I was a part of many projects that were really built, whether they were pavilion things or furniture for events that were held in Tokyo that we made completely out of plywood for like outdoor festivals and stuff. And then there was two earthquake resistant houses that we made in Nepal after the earthquake happened in 2015. And that time I went to like start my thesis research. So went to do my thesis research in Kathmandu. And then I went up into the rural areas, this area called Charikot. And we did a vineyard house up there for a family. And it was supposed to be a prototype for the rest of the community to see if they wanted to use this method of building as well. Because in the earthquake, a lot of people died because how the buildings were built. They weren't built to stand up to earthquakes. And in, in Nepal, the main material is brick. And without proper reinforcement, like the brick buildings just shudder apart. And it was really just from being in or around those buildings that many people died. Proposing plywood, something that's much lighter, that if it were to fall on people, like, of course, any material that falls on you, you're going to get injured, but it's a very different thing to be crushed to death which the plywood would not do. That's how we were kind of proposing it as an alternative. That was the first one. And then the second one, in 2016, I was actually able to be in charge. And I did the design and meeting with the structural engineers in partner with another guy in the lab. And then got to build that one too um, in Lalitpur, which is next to Kathmandu. It's still city, urban. All the while having to fulfill requirements for classes, doing assignments covered in, in sawdust, just on my laptop, just typing up assignments that are due and emailing them off to professors in Japan and stuff. And then now the thesis, finally, my thesis was about gender-based violence on refugee camps or internally displaced persons camps, IDP camps. I, I was visiting the IDP camps in Kathmandu, interviewing women, and gathering data, measuring the camps, analyzing how they were laid out, like from an architectural perspective, like what was it about the physical environment that would encourage predators or predatory behavior, things like the distance of water to where the people slept. Women would have to travel further for water or how exposed the bathing areas were. Or like just predators would, could take advantage of like the distance women would have to walk separating themselves from the community and just basically like gathering data at this distance can someone see if someone is being attacked like no they can't yes they can can someone hear if someone is crying for help no they can't yes they can kind of thing collecting all that information turning it into data and then writing a whole thesis around it but that that's what my master's experience was like i asked annabelle what it has been like Working and living in Asia as a Black woman. When I was in Nepal, I went to the UNHCR to talk about the research I had done on the IDP camps. And I step into the room and a British friend I made at the NGO where I was based, she wanted to tag along for the day. She's white. When I walk into the room, and I'm ready to sit down and show my research. All their eyes are directed at her. They keep asking her the questions. I keep answering the questions. She's like, she just keeps looking at me and I'm answering the, and it's like, when are these people gonna realize that I'm Annabelle and I'm the one doing the research? She has nothing to do with this. This is my research. She's just shadowing for the day. Because Asia, as much as there is no history of enslavement of Africans in Asia, under Europeans, but somehow, and I'm not saying somehow as if I don't know, I know exactly how, this thing has penetrated every corner of the world. This is Nepal. Nepal hasn't even ever been colonized by a European power. India was. 
Nepal was Neville. But somehow, deep in the Himalayas, when I walk into a room in the UNHCR, when people see me walk in to explain my research, they automatically think it could never be me who is conducting this research. That's just one story. I have several. That's in a professional capacity. The Japanese have never been like that, I have to say. But in Thailand, in Nepal, not so great. I've been to China as well, not so great. In social settings, there's always this kind of bringing up things like, oh, black people have rhythm, or like, and especially because I'm Jamaican, it's like, oh, you must be able to run fast, or you must be athletic, or expecting you to be the life of the party when that's just not my demeanor. It, it It's just always like feeling a pressure to be something I'm not, or to fulfill some kind of stereotype, basically. Fulfill some kind of image for them that when they see me, they want me to check these boxes and I just don't check these boxes for them. And even if you do check the boxes, it's like their definition of the box is so different from ours. What our dances mean to us is not what they think via you know their consumption. What our music means to us, they don't even understand. There's a, a very shallow understanding of what blackness is. And there's the over-sexualization of black women, and fetishization of black women. You'll have Japanese guys who they'll just want to try a black girl, I guess. You have guys who are into hip-hop culture or dancehall culture and they want to have a black girlfriend to just seal the deal and prove how black they are. I've seen a, a lot through just hanging out with other black women and just swapping stories and it's just so bizarre all the time. For me, my problem with dating in Japan is that for me it's basically been non-existent. I, I find black women tend to be very educated and tend to really stand firmly in what they believe, their thoughts, their worldview. They don't live passively, at least the black women I've interacted with in Japan, Nepal. They're very sure of themselves. Their opinions are mature. They've, they've thought these things through. They've, they've evolved in their thinking. They have reasons for thinking the way they think and stuff. And um, I can only speak to my friends who have dated Japanese men or like the brief encounters I've had with Japanese men. is like they don't like it in their own women and they don't like it in any other women either. The opinionated thing, it just turns them off. They just want you to be cute and funny and agreeable. Of course, this is not everyone. I, I would hope that goes without saying. I'm just, I'm speaking in a general, overwhelmingly regular, all the time kind of thing. It's just a pattern. Annabelle had clearly been working nonstop in this master's program. So I asked her, what did she do after graduation? And what was the process of applying for jobs in Japan? When I graduated, and only now in hindsight, look at it for what it was. It was complete burnout. And probably it may be controversial or unwise to say, to diagnose myself as depressed at the time. Like I, I never saw anyone, I never talked to anyone, but I was burnt out and I was just like deeply, deeply undermotivated and just, just feeling doom all the time. There's no motivation to wake up. I, I missed the window to apply for a job that I could fall into immediately after I graduated, right? The process for applying for jobs here is extremely strict and regimented on a timeline. And you start applying for a job in your first year of your master's. You don't apply after you graduate. You have to start a year before or a year and a half before. And there's all these processes that the companies make you go through. Like um, first round, second round, third round, just like vettings, 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 interviews, seminars, training, all kinds of things leading up to more serious interviews and then a second interview and a third interview and so on. And I had no clue about any of that. And that's another thing that like, I, I can only speak from my university, but I feel many foreign students have complained about the same thing where Japanese universities don't understand how unique that process is to Japan. But if you come here to study, they're not going to know to advise you. The time is just going to pass you by. And then it may be too late for you to try to get a job here. So luckily I was able to save that situation. My lab professor, he has a firm. He just let me work part-time for him 
once my final projects were handed in before I even graduated, I started working for him because he understood that like, and kind of felt bad that he never explained to me that that's what I needed to do to get a job. I was working with him for a bit, but it was, it was so overwhelming for me because he was working in Europe a lot. So I'd, I'd work all day and then I'd have to have meetings, Skype meetings with him at 1 a.m. And then the meetings could last three hours. And then it's 5 a.m. And then I have to start working soon and I can't fall asleep because I'm just so amped up. And it was just like that for months. And I was just out. I, I was just destroyed. I was done. And then I ended up fading out of working with him. And I had continued the, the part-time English teaching job that I was doing the whole time I was in school. At first, it was two streams of income, working part-time with him and then part-time teaching kids. And then the job with him just faded out because I just, I couldn't do it anymore. And I was teaching kids for almost a year after I graduated. At first, it kind of blew up badly because I was like, my performance was just dropping and I felt he was disappointed in me and he expected more. But anyway, we resolved our issues and he, he finally like helped me to understand how to get the job at the firm now. Because they had an English website and I was, I could read Japanese at the time, but it's still very hard. If I see English, I'm just going to, you know, read the English instead. But I was reading their English site and apparently the English site has less information, uh, less detailed information than the Japanese site does. So you, you won't find what you're looking for on the English site. He directed me to the Japanese site and he helped me understand that I, I needed to set up a sort of account before applying. And then through that account... They give me notifications like, okay, send in your resume now, send in your portfolio now. The interview will happen on this day at this time. Everything was supposed to happen through that account. Finally got that figured out. And then when I did, it was a lot easier after that. But then getting the job itself now was still <laughs> pretty hard because like Japanese firms, they're kind of letting go of this. But they said in the, one of the notifications that your resume has to be handwritten. Because it's cultural here, they feel they can know something about a person through their handwriting, about your character. I'm like, oh my god, okay. So I had to write out two pages of resume in full kanji. My hand was just locked up because, of course, I had to practice writing it to make it look good. And I was just writing it for a month, and my my hand just seized up after. Like I couldn't do anything with it for a while. Well, I finally got a presentable looking version of the resume and that's the one I sent in and with my portfolio. And any architecture student will know you have to have a good portfolio. But another challenging thing about this firm is that they only wanted one page, which sounds easier, but it's a very difficult thing to sum up your entire academic career on one page. And then you don't want to overcrowd it with drawings because overcrowd it and then the layout looks horrible and you can't understand anything anyway. White space is your friend. Space out the drawings, but then they'll become too small to read if you want space between them because it's one page. Figuring out how to do a, a good, attractive portfolio that actually conveys the meaning of your design on one page was a challenge too. There's so many versions of the portfolio. I, I spent three or four months on making a one-page portfolio. Then I sent that in and then I got called back for an interview. Then the interview is like, you can bring a bigger portfolio. And also I'm like, crap, now I have to make a long portfolio. I made a, a 40 page portfolio. Finally, as an opportunity, they saw the one page. Now they can see my whole academic career. They can see my perspective as someone who learned architecture in Jamaica to someone who, you know, learned in a Japanese school, did stuff in Nepal. But I finally got to show who I was, my thoughts on my approach as a designer. By the time I got to the interview, I was motivated, but I was also so ready to leave Japan at that time that I wasn't even nervous. I had already started packing up my things, just ready to leave forever. Because if I was talking about depression at the end of graduation, this is a year later, I had just sunk to the depths of the depths. I was just, I don't know, I was just existing, really. I was just done with this place that when I walked into that interview, it was probably the best thing for me for, to have been in that mental state because I wasn't trying to impress them. I wasn't being fake, which is very hard to do in Japan. But I wasn't being fake. I wasn't being anything other than just, I am here in this room, take it or leave it kind of thing. And I think that that helped because 
it was a long time since I'd seen Japanese people be that warm to me. I left the interview, got on the train, went back to my tiny broom closet of an apartment, and I literally shower put on pajamas, ready to sleep because I just don't want to think about anything. And then the email comes less than two hours after the interview is finished, got the job. I was like, what? It was so fast. And I'm like, whoa, I've already thrown away half my stuff. But anyway, that, that was the process of getting the job. And then after the interview, another stress load came when they start sending you all of these documents and contracts to sign. And it's just pages and pages and pages of Japanese. And I'm like, please don't do this to me. And I had to comb through all these pages, just days and days of making sure I fully understand this contract, signing, sending them stuff. And then when you sent that stuff, no, it's not over. We needed that signature to now ask you to sign this. And then it was just a month of paperwork, paperwork, paperwork. And then I finally got to start my job about a month and a half after the interview. I asked Annabelle to describe the Japanese work culture. Japanese is the language we work in. And I've been at the firm for about nearly two years now. It's been a roller coaster. Roller coaster. Like, the first two weeks was bliss. It was awesome. It was the happiest I had felt in years. And... I started to feel things again. I started to taste food again. Colors seemed brighter. I was coming back to myself. And then first deadline comes and then people's attitudes just change so much when something is on the line of deadline and you're this newbie who can't keep up on this. I needed this yesterday. Where is it? And I'm just like, oh God, oh God, they're going to fire me. They hate me. I'm making a horrible impression and it's not even been a month. And I don't know if I can do this. And this is the first time, like, no matter how say mentally or emotionally emotionally bad I've ever felt in my life. I've never been one to doubt whether I can do something or not. And that was one of the first times where I was like, oh my God, what if I'm just some clown who thinks I can be an architect, but I really don't have what it takes. And that was like devastating to me. It just went from the first two weeks of bliss to then this horrible next two weeks leading up to this deadline. And then the older people in the group had to end up taking over my work because I just couldn't get it done in time. And I, I just felt crap. I felt nothing lower than dirt. I felt so horrible. And then the next project came and then it was even worse. And then someone started bullying me. And then this guy was just poking me when no one else was looking kind of thing. And then he's Japanese. I'm not. Like, I didn't feel I could say it to anyone because, like... Would they believe me? Would they take my side? Bullying is extremely common in Japanese work environments. It's extremely common. And it's almost a part of the culture. A new person comes, you bully them. Because they were bullied by their seniors. They want to take it out on someone. This guy was taking it out on me. Because he wouldn't help me. He would just make me do everything. And then I just didn't have the know-how to do these things by myself. And when I would ask there was just no, no one was helping me do anything. And it, it was driving me insane. It's like, I don't know how to do this. You wanted this yesterday. You realize that the deadline has passed yet. You still will not help me do it. I just, the client is waiting on this thing. It's not me. It's the company's name that's on the line. Why isn't anybody helping me? This thing ended up being over two weeks late past the deadline because no one would help me. And I'm like, this could have been avoided if someone just, just freaking helped me. Anyway, Finally got it submitted. And then again, I just felt like, okay, I'm just going to forever be known as the the first black girl they let to this company. She can't meet deadlines. She she doesn't know anything. Da, da, da. And I'm just beating myself up on top of this guy bullying me and saying things like, no one here feels sorry for themselves. Like, do you see anyone here who feels sorry for themselves? And I'm just like, did I say I feel sorry? And it was just a mind... Mm. Anyway, and then I got put on another project. And for the first time, this project was with a, a senior architect, much older person. That's a big difference in Japan. When you work with people who are closer to your age, the competition and the bullying and the shaming is just horrendous. But when you work with the veterans you now, who they don't have anything to prove, you are not their competition in any capacity. They, they don't have any need to talk down to you or make you feel less than. 
but they have nothing to prove. They're very secure in who they are and their achievements as architects. I finally got to work with older architects and it was as if I was in a completely different firm. And then the first mid-year review came around and it's somehow people found out without me really saying anything that this guy was bullying me. But it's a shame though that I didn't have more faith in them as individuals rather than just like seeing them as like, okay, they're Japanese, they're going to take his side. Because once people found out, they all but ostracized him. And they were making fun of him for thinking that he was any better than me. And I just didn't expect people to take my side or have my back in any way. And they, they did in a major way. And it just kind of restored my faith in everything that like, I'm not crazy. And I'm not, I'm not this worthless, can't do or work, incompetent, whatever. This guy just conveniently withheld that this literally happens to every newbie. It's not like I'm uniquely incompetent. So it's a very different thing when you think like, oh my God, I'm in a room full of people who can do this thing and I'm the one person who can't. Versus understanding that no matter how great the architect, they started out like this. And that was a low and then... The high started to come back and then it kind of, it's kind of leveled out ever since where I've never wanted to feel that way ever again. So I've been very proactive with learning things that I predict might come up, learning different building codes and laws that I'm predicting like because of the type of projects I've been put on, I'm going to have to know how to design according to those codes, laws, regulations, etc. It's been working. I've been kind of good at predicting what might come my way. Anytime I have a shred of open, free-ish time, because there's never really free time, but any time where I can squeeze something in, I'm like trying to learn because I never want to be in that position again. That's what it's like working there so far. And I'd want to say, of course, if a situation is definitely toxic to you and you really feel like you can't take any more, leave, of course. But sometimes... Things just get better in a way that you could never predict. And I feel if I left when I was at that lowest of low, my impression of this job and this field would have just been kind of forever scarred. And I wouldn't have had the opportunity to see the good side of all those people who stood up for me and put that guy in his place. And I wouldn't have been able to heal from it. I would have been running away from it. And it would have just been frozen in time in my mind as this completely 100% bad thing when it's just there's just much more to that firm and to those people than that and I was using this one guy to try and understand everyone else that was around I'm glad I, I stuck it out. Asked Annabelle what her definition of wellness is and how has her experience living and working in Japan influenced her concept and also her practice of wellness? Now, when I first spoke with Annabelle a couple months ago in our preliminary chat, I told her that I like to ask the question of wellness to all of my guests because I just felt like as Black women, we don't talk about it nearly enough. And at the time, she hadn't really thought about what wellness had meant to her and if she even really considered herself practicing wellness. But by the time we got down to recording this interview, she had thought about it. And I think her reflections are really interesting. It's interesting that you say like black women don't talk about it enough because I'm one of those black women who like that never even occurred to me as a concept. What's wellness? (laughs) I guess everything I've said up until now would probably indicate this. I'm someone who just pushes myself to the point of burnout and then beyond burnout and then beyond, beyond that. In more recent years, I've started to realize how unsustainable it is. And maybe that was my first realization of my probably being unwell. I've tried to like go through what things that I was doing instinctively to kind of keep myself going. And I guess that would be my wellness. But there are some things I eliminate completely, like pressure to participate in social events when... I know that I don't have the money or I don't have the energy where say it's a Sunday night and people want to go drinking and I know I have responsibilities Monday morning. I have to work. I have to be at my best performance at work. Then I'm just going to say no. Something I learned over the years in Japan 
and I, I didn't realize I was practicing it as a form of wellness was to just say no. Like don't feel forced to participate in these social gatherings. Eating out here is very expensive. You have to pay so much for food and drink and you end up feeling like crap after. And I just had to learn to say no. And a second thing is how I eat. I used to eat very badly because student, um, always on the brink of running out of money. I was just rationing what, how much I could eat of, of my rice and stuff like, and just not buying probably as much vegetables as my body needed and that kind of stuff. I really made the shift to like think about nutrient dense foods. I'm, I've been vegetarian and out of pescatarian for a long time since the end of high school. So I, I'm, I'm health conscious. But then when you're a vegetarian and you're traveling and you're not willing to compromise and then you're also on a budget, sometimes you just don't end up eating anything or you end up eating a lot of bread and potatoes and stuff, stuff that's just not really giving you any nutrients. Nutrient dense foods and, and putting the money out to buy vegetables, buy fruits, buy grains and oats and things like that, that will nourish me. And I've seen a marked difference in my performance just by eating better. And then the third thing is exercise, something that I was just neglecting, just trying to work, work, work. Since the pandemic, working from home, the time that it spared me going to work to and from on the train, nearly four hours of my day recovered. I've been working out and I feel like a whole new person. It's unreal. I can't describe how much better I feel. Thank you so much, Annabelle. Thank you so much for sharing. And if you want to keep up with Annabelle via social media, you can. On my Instagram, it's Annabelle Um. I, but I mean, people ask me questions on Instagram about how to get into schools here and stuff. And I always very gladly give detailed answers if anyone has questions about getting into architecture school or getting a job in architecture in Japan, like feel free to ask. Thank you all so much for listening. I hope to see all of you at the next live Q&A this Sunday with Carla. And if you have not signed up for the Flourish in the Foreign Community, make sure that you sign up so I can send you the event details for this Sunday. I am so grateful to all of you. Thank you so much for your support and thank you so much for your love. Thank you just so much for listening. I, I appreciate that. I want to ask all of you who are listening. I know some of you guys have never lived abroad and you're wanting to. Maybe you have a target date of six months, a year, or maybe more like three to five years. Some of you have lived abroad, have repatriated and maybe thinking about going abroad again. And even some of you are listening who are currently abroad and are looking for community. I want to know all about y'all. I really do because I'm putting together some resources and I want to know what is it that you're struggling with. Are you struggling with perhaps preparing for your first time going abroad, choosing a country, figuring out how you're going to support yourself? Or are you repatriated back at home and you're struggling with trying to kind of reassimilate to your home country or think about a different kind of game plan to go back abroad? Or are you currently abroad and you're just looking for support to sustain your life abroad? Now that can be financial, maybe you're looking for professional advice, career advice, or maybe you're looking for how to really set down roots, Maybe you're thinking about purchasing real estate. Let me know because I'm putting together some resources and I want to be able to give you guys what you need. As you guys see, I'm talking to women who have done it all and they're doing it all over the world. And so I have access to these fantastic women that I can tap to give you guys what you're looking for. But I can only give you what you're looking for if you tell me. So let me know what you need and I'm going to try my best to give it to you in some of the resources that I'm creating. Also, I just want to remind you all that I am a business strategist. I have worked for myself for quite a while 
And I have clients who are women of color who are looking to leverage their talent and expertise into viable online businesses. That means freelancing or consulting so that they can be both professionally fulfilled and financially abundant while they pursue their thriving life abroad. If you are interested in learning more about my signature 12 week sprint, it is a program that I do one on one with my clients to help them get from A to Z. We make it happen. We launch businesses, we launch products and services. So if you're interested in learning more about how I can help you, go ahead and drop me a line. You can contact me via my website, www.christinejobe.com. And thank you all who have just found the podcast via the Exodus Summit. Thank you so, so much for listening to my chat at the Exodus Summit. And shout out to Stephanie and Rashida for putting on the Exodus Summit. It was beautifully put on. And from everyone's account, it was just everything that they needed. So kudos to you, ladies. And welcome to the new listeners who have found Flourish on Foreign via the Exodus Summit. And if you identify as a woman of color podcaster, perhaps you're a newbie like me, or you have been in the podcasting game for a while, you will definitely want to check out the WOC Podcasters Insiders membership. I am a member of this membership, and let me tell you, it has been super helpful for me getting this podcasting thing together because, like I said, I'm a newbie. I launched this podcast in May, and this podcast just surpassed 5,000 downloads, and let me tell you, it has been work. It has been work. And ever since I joined the WOC Insiders Podcasters membership, my mind has been blown with just the strategy, some of the tips and tricks, and just game that I just didn't know about podcasting, making my life a lot easier and definitely letting me be able to do even more interesting and cool things for you, my lovely audience. So if you are interested in getting into podcasting or you've been podcasting for a while, I definitely recommend checking out WOC Podcasters Insiders Membership. To join the membership, please use the Flourish No Foreign affiliate link. It is at no extra cost to you, but it is another way to support this podcast. You can find the link in the show notes on the website and in the link in the bio across all social media channels. Thank you to Zachary Higgs, who produced the music of this podcast. Zachary is a fantastic musician and artist. If you need some music for your YouTube channel, your podcast, I just know that he's definitely your guy. I will leave all of his information in the show notes as well. Shoot him a message and he will definitely hook you up. That is all for this week. I hope you all take such good care of yourselves. Please be gentle with yourself. Please be mindful of the things that you are ingesting mentally and try to feed your mind and your heart and especially your intentions all the things that you want. Focus on the life that you're creating and focus on all the things that you would love to see. Yes? Okay. See you next week. On the next episode of Flourish in the Foreign. You should be moving with intention. Why am I moving abroad? What am I hoping to get out of it? Right? And these things will all guide your finances. Also, where are you in the circle of life? Are you a student? Are you mid-career? Are you professional? Are you executive? Because if you're a student, maybe you don't have that much money. If you're executive or mid-level career, you've got investments, you might have real estate, you might have a lot of other things that you have to wear. You might have kids, you might still have to contribute to their education. I've been in this space in financial services and banking, two top banks, in their expat and international banking divisions, one of them running. People get ready to move abroad, they don't think about finances. That has not changed in 25 years at all. 